What happens when you have an exponent? Um, when you when you, your exponent is your variable, the only way to bring that down and solve it is through a log. So right now, as we do your exponential function, we're going to solve them graphically, and we're going to see where you know where we find our solution on our table. So we're going to look at your exponential graph. And then the second part of this, well, mostly this is only like a little quarter of it. Then we we flip to log, and then it hopefully. Once you see logs, they're just their inverses of your exponents. You kind of get a better feel for it. We flip your tables. We interchange your x and y. It's a regular inverse rule. And then we do your log equations. The same exact applications that we do graphically, we turn around and do them algebraically. So when we go to do that part, you'll already have your, your equations written up. We'll just solve them algebraically. So graphically, we'll do the exponential part, and algebraically, we'll do the log part, if that makes any sense. The same, same as you probably had to do in algebra 2. Um, we don't really do too much more with your logs than you already did in algebra 2. We do JC. You did JC in algebra 2. Um, we don't really do too many, too many new things. Uh, just kind of reinforce what you learned, and we do more of the applications here than we did in algebra 2. Do we, do we use natural logs? The basic natural logs, yeah. You, in, um, when you take the log of each side, you can always just take the ln of anything, even if it's not a natural log, but you cannot take the log of a, of a natural log. So we, we do that part too. If you look in a lot of college books, when they do logs, they do ln, the natural log. They never really say log, log. You know, they say ln, ln. And uh, the lns have a nicer set of rules that make more sense. So we're just going to start the next couple of days looking at your exponential function. And a lot of this is fairly simple. <laughs> what I want you to get used to is sketching and not relying on your calculator. Because what we want to sketch is a basic graph. Um, we're going to look at your calculator and see how it makes our sketch look. And then from there, we're going to be sketching. So we, we just kind of introduce logs and exponents. This is fairly easy here. So if you put this into your calculator, we're going to get to see where these things, where your exponential functions all have the same characteristics and where they differ. So if you don't mind just graphing that, know what the negative does? The negative exponent? One over. It, it flips it over. It takes the reciprocal to the positive. So 2 to the negative 2, 1 over 2 squared. So as we go negative, the numbers are smaller. And we're going to use this negative again because it also doesn't reflection wherever we stick our negatives. So we're going to be Using those, we're going to be doing your transformations off of these as well. All right, so you should find some common points here. What we're looking for is just things that we can identify in each one of these. You can leave it in fraction, you can put it in decimal, whichever you prefer. It's easier if you're doing without your calculator, obviously, to leave it in a fraction, because you really don't need the calculator to, to do this one. Probably when we get to the 5 or the 6 base. And, and if you realize that we can't go too high with our base, because your sketch would be kind of crazy. So we just get used to a sketch for a normal exponential curve. They're pretty much going to follow this pattern. They're going to cross here. We're going to find, again, that this they have in common because any, any base 
raised to the zero power is one. So we're going to find this in common. What's the domain of this exponential function? All real numbers, good. What's the range? So, one, one is here, zero is here. Can I use a zero? Will I ever get a zero? <coughs> no, but I can use right <coughs> above it. So, zero to infinity, but I can't use the zero. This becomes a natural asymptote. This is your asymptote. This is good to keep track of because as we do transformations and we shift up or down, left or right, we want to kind of keep track of your asymptote. Okay, we're good with this. Alright, now you, you can compare yours as you go down. Might not have to clear a, a move, but this table. Last one we'll graph. We don't graph too many because they all kind of start looking the same. And we get kind of get used to the pattern here. So graph with a base of five. This is my base. My next one. So if you graph to your base of 5, okay, and because these numbers are few, <laughs> we still graph them the same way. The only thing is, this goes up a little sharper. But it still crosses at the zero one. It still has the same domain. It still has the same range. And it still has the same horizontal asymptote. And we could never graph these kind of numbers. So we sketch them the same way. So I would prefer you get used to the sketching rather than relying on your calculator. Because those numbers you'd never be able to put in there. You could get 1.5, but you'd never get 2.25 or any of that. They're all just going to follow the same general path for this. I just sketched it. That's what I said. Don't rely on your graph. Rely on your sketch. The difference here is the other one comes down and goes, uh, goes further out this way. It goes a little bit like this. The two is a little wider. Because... I can graph more of these numbers. I can't graph these numbers in here. So we're li relying more on sketching when we do exponential functions, not graph. So I just wanted you to see what's the difference between when we have a base of 2 and when we have a base of 5. This one's forcing. These got real small over here, smaller than the 2s, and that would make sense. These got a little larger, and that would make sense because your base is bigger. And then the 2 goes in here. Your natural log, your natural log fits somewhere between the two and the three, and we'll um, between the two and the three, and we'll see that we'll do that part tomorrow. So, but just so that you get kind of the the patterns for this, and realize that we're not going to be using your calc, we're going to be graphing. So we're going to be looking at basic for a graph, and these are the graphs. These are the graphs that we're going to depend on and we're going to sketch with. And we're going to sketch all your transformations and everything through these guys. So your basic graph again is going to look like this. And you can see that if you put a base of 2, if you put a base of 5, if you put a base of 10, they all have the same look. So our sketch is just going to look like this. When we negate the x, when your, your xy goes to negative xy, it follows your transformation rule. Where is your reflection if I go from positive x to negative x? 
over the y-axis. It's just a reflection in the y-axis. So now my graph, excuse me, is just coming down this way. So that everybody realizes we're not using a couch, we're just stepping. Because some of those bases you would not be able to put in your couch. So again, they're common attributes. They all use a domain of all real numbers. The range didn't change for these. Zero to infinity. Your y-intercept, this is your common point between all your base all your core graphs, whatever the base is, it still crosses through the zero one with no transformations. Is this one, when we keep x positive, is this an increasing function or a decreasing function? This is an increasing function. And my asymptote is where? Y equals zero. It's a continuous function. I'm increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity. The only difference here is this guy is a decreasing function. And I'm decreasing from negative infinity to positive infinity. And my asymptote stays the same. And these are both continuous functions. So these are basic sketches that we will be using when we talk about your exponential core graph. Core graphs, not applications, basic core graphs. And we'll do all your transformations off of these. In other words, if I gave you this, this is 2 to the x, there's my core, say that's my core over there, and then we gave you this, 2 to the x plus 4. Where's that plus 4 going to make my graph go? Up. So it's going to go up 4. If this is my point 0, 1, I'm going to go up to 0, 5. And go like this. If this is my asymptote at y equals 0, and I go up 4, my asymptote is going to be y equals 4. So we're working off sketch. We're not using the couch for this. So if you keep track of where your, your transformations are, it, it's a little bit easier. It's more confusing if you do it in the calculator. Because sometimes you don't see those numbers and then you spend your time trying to change your window to see your function and it doesn't make any sense. Are we okay with this? Okay, these are our core, our basic core graphs. Core graphs, you probably call them parent graphs. Um, I guess I still am always stuck on the core graph. I like the core graph concept better. So whichever one you call this is absolutely fine. So again, we start with your core graph. We're just going to sketch your core graph, no couch. And what does this plus 5 cause me to do? Inside the x. Go to the left, 5 base. So we're going to move to the left, 5 base. Now, when we move to the left, 5 bases, this guy's going left, 5 bases. So somewhere we're going up here. Somewhere, we're going to get a new y-intercept. How do I find my y-intercept? x equals 0. So if I let x equals 0, and I plug this in, I will get 2 to the 5th. And what is 2 to the 5th? What is it? 2 to the 5th is 32. Sounds like. Sounds like. 4, 16, 32. So 0, 32. There's my intercept. Then of course I don't see it. I'm just going to cross way up there. What is my domain? Did my domain change when I did this? When I took a horizontal horizontal shift, and we're still going to explain them the same way. Left 5 units. So my domain did not change. All real numbers. If since I moved horizontally, did my range change? 
No. And as a result, my asymptotes change. So you're gonna just describe it like you always have. They work the same as the other ones if they're next to the X. They work the same way as the other ones did if they're outside of the X. The, the negative reflections work the same way. They all work the same way. And just keep track of your domain, your range, your asymptote, and your y-intercept. Your x-intercept we can't do right now because we didn't do lots with it. We could do it on your graph, but we didn't do logs with you, so if we put y is 0 in here, we didn't teach you the log. Well, we, in here, we didn't go through the log statement yet, so we won't do that part yet. That will save for later. Okay, let's talk this one for a minute. Square graph, again, they're very, very basic. We start off kind of nice here. Very basic graph. This is my core graph. What is this saying it's going to do? Five units up. Do you have a plus? Oh, plus up. <laughs> five units up. So keep track of your y-intercept here. Add five. Add five to everything. Watch. If I add five to this guy, my new intercept is at 0, 6. If I add 5 to this guy, my new asymptote is at 5. So I know exactly where this is. If my range was 0 to infinity, I add 5. And I am 5, but I can't use 5, to infinity. So a vertical, just keep track of your things. Just a horizontal shift is not going to change because your domain is all real numbers. So your vertical shift is going to go up 5 units and keep the same thing. And this point will now be at 0, 6. And your asymptote, y equals 5. So my domain stays the same. My range is going to move up 5. My asymptote is going to go up 5. And my y-intercept went up 5 also. If it goes down, same thing. Keep track of it. But this is just your basic transformations that we're applying to some of your graphs. Okay, one more. Again, we start with your core graph. That's why it's so much easier to sketch than it is to use your calculator. This was your original point. Right. And what is this negative causing me to do? Reflect over which axis? My x-axis, because my x stays the same. My x is not affected, but my y is negating. So when y goes from positive to negative, I'm a reflection over the x-axis. So when I reflect over the x-axis, it just comes down here. Did my domain change? No. Did my range change? Yes. So now what can I use from negative infinity to stop at where? Zero. Zero. Did my asymptote change? No. Still the same line. Where's my y-intercept? Zero, negative one. And the only other thing that changed is I wasn't increasing before. Now I'm a decrease. Well, oh, no, 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 I'm a decreasing. I know you're used to looking at the two there in front of like an X minus something. Yeah, but that's just the base. 
Okay, so now I'm the decreasing function. So basically, this is what I want you to just get used to on your homework. Try not to use your calculator. Try to just sketch them. Label all your things. I transferred these from the book to a worksheet for you. But try to just describe all your transformations like we always did. There's a couple of little matching ones out there. Match them with your transformations. transformation rules for um, blogs. I'll print them out for you. They work the same way, just to review them, they work the same way as your regular rules do. These are your, oh, these are logs. I don't want your logs. You're doing it for me. Sorry. I'll print these out when you do logs. So you can start your homework. 